ahead on Catalyst. Paul Willis braves Mount Ruapehu. Keeping an eye on New Zealand's most deadly volcano. Mary Ann finds out how cancer cells avoid death. Is cancer harder to treat than we thought? And I talk to genetics pioneer Dr. Craig Venter about his latest mission. It could be a new industrial revolution replacing machines with biology. Dr. Craig Venter is renowned for his taking on of the scientific establishment in the race to read the human genetic code. To do it, he developed a fast-track method for sequencing DNA, which was then controversial, but now has become the industry standard. In addition, in 2007, he became the first person to map the complete human genome of an individual. It was his genome. Well, I recently caught up with him and found he's tantalisingly close to another remarkable achievement. You might call it intelligent design. Circumnavigating the world aboard a 90-foot sloop named Sorcerer 2 seems an unlikely place to begin creating artificial life. All right, let's go for it. But innovation has seen Dr. Craig Venter achieve implausible goals in the past. He believes a breakthrough is imminent. And the millions of organisms collected by this vessel, and also from beneath the Earth's crust, will provide building blocks for synthetic organisms he hopes will power the planet with greener energy. Already, Dr. Craig Venter's team has achieved two milestones, transferring the genome of one bacterium into another and separately manufacturing a genome from scratch. The final step is to combine the two, transplanting a synthetic genome into a living bacterial cell. So when are you going to make the big step of putting the artificial genome into a bacterium? Well, it's something uh, we have 20 people working on almost around the clock. I've stopped predicting uh, because I've predicted for two years it will happen that year. Uh, so we think we're very close. Uh, each time we've tried to do it, we found there were barriers in biology uh, to discourage that from happening. And I think we've solved them one at a time, but I think we really have to wait till we have the, the proof, hopefully soon, but uh, I, I don't want to predict. What are the challenges? Like if you can take the DNA out of a bacterium and fiddle with it and put it back into a different bacterium, what's so hard about putting a synthetic genome into a bacterium? The DNA really has to be accurate. So we have some pieces where even one letter changing out of a million is enough to have it not work. So it's like with our computer software, if uh, there's a glitch in the software, the program crashes. Uh, this is no different, this is the software of life. So we're having to learn all these new rules uh, because nobody's ever tried to do this before. Okay, once, you, once you've achieved that, one of your goals is to try to deal with some environmental problems. How do you do that? We have a program trying to look deep in the earth to discover a new life forms. We've discovered thousands of these that are more than a mile deep in the earth that live off of coal, convert coal into natural gas. Really? Is that, is that really surprising that there's that much life down there? When we started these experiments, we knew there was things down there. Nobody knew how many, what the diversity was, but we found the same density of cells that we find in the ocean, about a million cells per milliliter, and amazing new life forms, uh, very complex single cell organisms that live in this environment. And then we're trying to harness them to see if we can convert coal in the ground uh, into methane, natural gas, instead of digging up the coal and burning it. It's about a tenfold improvement. It's still taking new carbon out of the ground. Uh, but then we have a uh, different solution we're working on where we're trying to take CO2 and have that be the source of the carbon for new fuels. And so we're using algae right now and sunlight to fix the carbon dioxide into hydrocarbons. So how do you do that? You, you somehow rather get the algae to produce oil. We've uh, changed a few of these genetically, adding some unique genes from plants where the algae just pump the hydrocarbons out into the solution. And so it creates many biofactories. And so it's like a continuous production just with sunlight and carbon dioxide. And the challenge, you know, for a biologist is going from a tiny test tube to a beaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now we have to go from a beaker to a billion gallons. 
so nobody's ever gone to that scale before, and that's what the challenge is. Because if we can't produce billions of gallons a year per facility, it's not going to amount to anything. But presumably, because you've got life there, bacterial life that can multiply and exponentially grow, that's right. the solution. That's right. That's what makes biology just a, a potent force in all these areas. You could create a whole new kind of version of life that has all sorts of amazing properties. And that's what biology will become with these new tools we've developed, a, a design project. So just like we have software engineers, we actually have software for designing organisms in the computer, because DNA is the software, and I think that's been one of the biggest surprises. You just change the software in the cell, the cell converts into a new species, because life is really dynamic, constantly reading the DNA and making proteins. You put in new software, they read new software, make new proteins, and turn into something else. So it could ultimately become kind of a manufacturing technology, couldn't it? There's, if you use your imagination a little bit, there's probably no aspect of uh, human endeavor that it could not impact. We get all our pharmaceuticals, uh, all our materials for uh, clothing, carpets, plastics from oil. We can replace all those starting with carbon dioxide as a source just get cells to manufacture what we want them to do. So it could be a new industrial revolution, replacing machines with biology. What do you say to people who say, wait a minute, you're playing God here, you're making life, you know, you're Dr. Frankenstein? If you remember back to when the first heart transplants were done, the first kidney transplants, uh, uh, every time there's a breakthrough that gives uh, us as humans more control over our own lives, uh, people make that argument, but we're going from, I think the latest number, 6.8 billion people now on the planet to around nine and a half over the next 40 years. And we don't have enough food, water, medicine, uh, fuel, shelter uh, for the 6.8 billion that are here now. So we are 100% dependent on science as a society. If you're cynical, you, you can say we have to now come up with new science to overcome the problems of the previous science. And that's in part true. So we need these new tools of science uh, to change our chance of survival and not destroy our planet. More of my interview with the fascinating Craig Venter and his synthetic life can be found on our website. Here's what's on the program next week. Oh. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget the website. I'm Graham Phillips. See you next time. Since my interview with Dr. Craig Venter, he announced the successful synthesis of a self-replicating bacterium. Details at the Catalyst website.